Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Well, hello, Mr. Burmese. Well, hello, Ms. Mans. Oh, yes, I scribe you, indeed. I don't know what Mr. Uh, we don't could do the old either. school NX. Star Trek where everyone is Mr. Or just Mans. Mans. His last name. Well, then I sound like a fratty. Hey, Mans. What up, Mans? <laughs> hey, Burmese. Hey, Burmese. <laughs> and hello, you out there. Whatever your last name is. Hello, dear listener. (laughs) Dear listener. (laughs) And welcome to a brand new thing, the season, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, episode, uh, a collection of uh, this wonderful podcast that we call Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Uh, My name is Aki Burmese, and... And I'm Stevie Manns. And uh, we're just so excited... I, I'm if you trying to get tell. it all in order. Yeah, We're so am I excited? excited? No, no, no. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm cool as the other side of the pillow. All right. Uh, <laughs> We're 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 and we're changing up the format slightly, uh, just so, so things are a little more clear. So I just at the top, I just want to let you know today's star date is star date one two one 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 nine point six, and we'll be discussing season four, episode one of Star Trek Discovery, season four. I say unto thee, episode one of Star Trek Discovery, entitled Kobayashi Maru. Uh, pew, 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 pew. But before we get into that, uh, I just want to let you know that Set Phasers were a podcast and basically we're an after show where we discuss weekly, uh, as timely as possible, the episodes of Star Trek that have just come out. In this instance, we're beginning season four of Star Trek Discovery and we'll be going to, at it week to week, coming out every Monday, discussing the episode and things that we loved about it. And also we have, I think, a full backlog of, of Discovery seasons one, two, and three. Yeah. Picard season one, s- s- Lower Decks. If you want to recap two. stuff, we have all of it for like the last yeah. year and a half, I think. If you're trapped on a desert island with excellent Wi Fi, you can listen to hours of our coverage of Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we're called Set Phasers. We also have a Patreon, Stevie. We do have a Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com forward slash Set Phasers. You can. Join our Patreon for early access to audio and video episodes, where normally the free episodes are only out Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. But if you join our Patreon, you can get them ahead of time as they are live streamed. That is exclusive access. And of course, we also do Netflix watch parties for our our famous and lovely patrons. Famous, I don't know why I said famous. (laughs) Famous to us. And you're just dancing around in front of me, that's why. And well, this is what I think I'll do for Patreon. So people know if you get the <laughs> Patreon level where you can watch it live, whenever Stevie does this rundown, I'll dance the whole time. Oh, yeah. And it's it's great dancing, people. You don't want to miss out on that. And of course, uh, we also do shout outs for our patrons, too. So that is patreon.com forward slash set phasers. If you want to become an ensign, a lieutenant or a commander. 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 Ensign Lieutenant or Commander. Indeed. Yes, that dancing really took it out of me. I don't know how long we're going to keep that in here. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess we got to get into it. I guess it's time to run yeah. down this episode. Season four, episode one, Star Trek Discovery, Kobayashi Maru. Let's run it down. Let's run it down. It's time to run it down. Can you run it down for me? What just happened? Can you run it Okay, listen, I have a tendency to get caught in the weeds, but we're just going to run down this episode because this season looks like it's going to start. It's going somewhere crazy. We begin with Captain Michael Burnham. Captain Michael Burnham. Captain Michael Burnham and Book. They're on the uh, planet, a planet of uh, what I can only describe as bioluminescent butterflies or moths. And they're doing some outreach for the Federation with the Al Shane who, uh, in my notes, I describe as an all-white mafia people. 
<laughs> they were sort of a cross between Andorians and butterflies to me. Yes, kind of where like, I... uh, they're like a pale Andorian butterfly people. Yeah. Uh, and basically they're offering them the dilithium because you remember in the last season they found that whole planet full of dilithium and once they took care of the reasons for the burn they're able to mine all this dilithium so now there's an abundance of it and they're trying to bring the federation back and so they're offering dilithium with quote no strings attached uh despite their best efforts there is a vast misunderstanding between the alshanes and michael and book and eventually uh well i think the main crux of where things go wrong is uh books carnivorous pet cat grudge uh apparently the alshane are not carnivores they find it offensive and then they find out that grudge is a quote queen which is something that book says quite a bit and which uh, in my tinfoil hours i speculate on endlessly uh and they say we will free the queen and so the glowing butterflies form wings on their backs and armor and like masks over their eyes and they pull weapons and they start chasing michael and book and they're chasing through a forest, and they have to jump off a cliff, and they get into one thing, and that thing gets destroyed, and then they got to chase, run by the rock, and everything. However, uh, they're having trouble flying, and with the help of her trusty crew, Michael is able to figure out that because of the magnetic shift, the shift of the magnetic poles of the planet, the Alshane are having trouble navigating, because I guess they're like birds or something. And in order to prevent that from happening, they have these satellites, but the satellites run on dilithium, and so they send a bunch of dots over from Discovery to refill the dilithium into the satellites, and that helps the Alshane uh, uh, basically be able to navigate, but they're still shooting at Michael and Book. But Michael and Book run off of a cliff onto Book's ship, which I still don't think we have a name for. Hmm. Um, I just call it Sword Ship, because it looks like a sword. It's a, it's a weird looking thing. It just reminds me of a slice of pizza. Slice of pizza, sure. Uh, and yeah, so they get on the pizza ship, and uh, <laughs> notably, Book leans over and pets Grudge before they take off into the atmosphere and join their crew on the Discovery. It's great to see the crew again. Uh, Lieutenant Reese is, is, has the con. He's in the chair. Tilly is science officer. Uh, Adira and Stamets down in engineering are helping figure out this whole... Uh, uh, everything's going great. I see. So aside from this like crazy early opening thing with the people and the misunderstanding and a lot of anger and and uh, uh you know uh, uh, diplomacy is hard everything's going great for the federation that's how i would describe the first half of this episode and it made me very very nervous uh they fly back and a number of things happen basically book is going to go to his home planet of quajon because his nephew is going through uh, something that I wrote down. It's called the EQ Zen Ceremony. And I guess it's some sort of rite of passage into adulthood. And Michael's like, I'll join you there in a bit. But she has to do this speech back at uh, Federation headquarters because they're after 125 years, they're reopening Starfleet Academy. I smell a spinoff. <laughs> and they, uh, <laughs> she has to give a speech. Cadet but Academy also, or something. Could, exact Cadet Academy 3221 or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> that's 3190 something. Mm -hmm. uh, don't quote me on that. And then the but she has to give the speech and then like introduce the new president of the Federation. And apparently Michael's upset because the president's kind of a politician. He doesn't want to get dragged into politics, whatever. Other than that slight misgiving, everything is like everyone is smiling a lot, like a ton. Like everyone's smiley, smiley, smiley. Like, ah, oh, it's great to see you, books. Great to see you, Mike. See you on Quajon. Have a look at your your nephew's uh, Izu Ken uh, is Iku Zen ceremony, et cetera, et cetera. Even when Mike is giving the, the the speech, the cadets, it's full of hope and joy and love and 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 all the wonderful. It's like the end of a season of Star Trek Discovery, and that's why I was got this creeping feeling that things were going terribly, terribly, terribly wrong. Anyway, Michael introduces the new president, uh, President Laura Rillick, who's a total po politician, but gives a sort of nice speech and introduces the new Archer space dock behind her and we get a Archer. sweeping Archer and we get the music from uh, <laughs> not the the theme song from Star, Star Trek uh, Enterprise but rather the sort of the orchestral theme that played towards the end of the episodes which was a lovely theme uh, it's a bit of a schmaltzy moment but uh, you know I, I, I got my eyes weren't dry and um you love a bit of orchestral music, don't you? I do love a bit of orchestral music. I can't help myself. I just love it. And Michael gets called away by Admiral Vance. Apparently there's a deep space repair station 
uh, that's in trouble and uh, they've sent a message that got cut off and there's no time to send any ships at warp even though Quajan is close to that planet they wouldn't be able to get there in time so Disco is going to go immediately using the spore drive and President Rillac wants to go and she decides she is going to go over Michael's protests so they leave the station they jump there's a little friction between Michael and the President they s jump to the station and the station is basically wheeling through space like an absurd like crazy like all, on, on three axes and uh, there's some sort of extreme spatial lensing that happened at the time that their their thrusters failed. Uh, Tilly and Adira, who is Adira, who is a little nervous because they've just made Ensign and wants to prove that they deserve to be there. Uh, they beam over to help the crew of that space station get their act together. Uh, they get there and there's a guy named Commander Nollis, and he is very much on edge and kind of immediately starts talking down to them, even though they're Starfleet, like, yo, dude, but whatever. Uh, they're like, okay, fine. Tilly's like, yeah, 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 fine. We'll defuse the situation. You can hold on to the programmable matter and we'll do some other stuff. And they're going to try to get this station back uh, under control. At the, at, as they get the, the station out of, like, its crazy spin, uh, frozen methane hail starts sweeping in and crashing into things. And so Discovery, which has matched orbit with the station, has to expand its shield. And now there's, like, this frozen methane rain which is a weird thing because that wouldn't really be that close to a planet so it must have come from somewhere far away uh commander Nalus is now extremely on edge they don't have time to sort of like fix the station and move away so now they have to abandon the station it's a repair mission uh but the they can't get to the escape pod that like would take them there and back so they have to use the one that's on the level that's sort of only supposed to go but Adira is able to reprogram it so it can go and come back and then go and come back but it's being blocked by some sort of wreckage and so Michael decides to go over over the protests of President Rillick now protest over protest over protest and goes down there in a ship but the ship gets hit by some methane a truck drives past my window very loudly that's the sound of methane hitting a ship Michael has to continue in a spacesuit, manage to get things cleared. They have to go over in two teams. The first team goes, and who's left behind is Tilly, Adira, and Commander Nalas. Uh, uh, they, the first crew goes over, comes back. Now, as they're doing the second trip, which is going to take five minutes, they find out on the bridge of Discovery that it's going to be four minutes before the shields fail, and then there's going to be open vacuum and just this crazy hail of methane frozen methane chunks that they can do nothing about. President Relic is like, we should go. We should cut our losses. You can't save everyone. Michael's like, we are going to save everyone. We are going to wait. I don't care what it takes. They do manage to get into the ship. They fly over to Discovery and jump away. But just as some debris crashes into the landing bay, boom, crash, smash, boom. Uh, turns out uh, Tilly and Adira, fine. Nalus? Not kaput. so much. Yeah, well, uh, several others also died. And apparently there were some huge injuries. Uh, Michael is getting gets sort of a dressing down from the president later, who's like, I was not here just in a political capacity. I was trying to decide who would be the captain of our new Voyager ship, which is going to be super dope. Michael's like, with all due respect, president, I wouldn't have left Discovery because it's my home, uh, but I don't see how my command style is bad. They have a long discussion about the Kobayashi Maru, which is a whole thing if you watch enough Star Trek. If you watch Star Trek, you know what the Kobayashi Maru is. You know the Kobayashi Maru test, and you know that only one person has ever passed it, and it's only because they cheated, and that person was James Tiberius Kirk. Uh, so yeah, that is what happens there. We'll come back to that in a second. Meanwhile, Book is on, the, on Quajan, which is near the closest planet to uh, the Deep Space Repair Beta 6. He does this touching... Uh, a ceremony with his nephew at what they call the World Root, which I guess is just a huge tree that runs through their space druid planet. They put blood and sap from the tree into a thing that they wear on their neck, which apparently Book doesn't have mm, ten foil time. And uh, then they're like, "Go run off, play." And, you know, there's all again so many smiles and happy looks that I was like, I I thought at this point uh, a space dragon jumps down and eats all of them. It just looked too happy. Uh, but what happens is like <laughs> birds fly away and Book gets up in a ship to see what's happening and he tells uh, his his uh, brother and his nephew to find cover and then he gets hit by something. He sees like a weird uh, like planetoid shape in the sky and then he gets hit and knocked out and his ship goes on autopilot to Discovery 
And when he wakes up, he's on Discovery, and he's like, we got to get to Quajon. Something was happening there. And they they search for Quajon on their long-range sensors, uh, sensors, sensors. On their long-range sensors. And they can find nothing. And when they look a few uh, light years further, they find a destroyed planet. And Book there looks upon the destruction of the planet that once was Quajon, and he says, they're all gone. <laughs> Well, that is the end of season four, episode one, of Star Trek Discovery, the Kobayashi Maru. How exciting. You want to chat? Should we, uh, I don't know, should we chat about this episode or something? I don't know, do we have a drop for that? Let's do, let's do. I say, darling, let's do a quick chat about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes yeah. let's do. <laughs> oh, what, uh, what wonderful British voiceover actor did you get to, uh, record that drop, Stevie? I don't know. It's, it was it was quite a quite a performance, wasn't it? Whoever they are, very talented. Very. And they brought they brought their own extras to do some claps. Huh? That's interesting. Uh, okay, let's talk about the episode. Any significant moments that you enjoyed? I have like four bullet points. Do you? Okay. Well, one of the things that I had was not necessarily like a moment, but it was part of the set. Um, the mm-hmm. AR wall. Yes. Wow. That's. Say what? Say what? That really elevates things, doesn't it? You're because I remember looking at that scene and I hadn't twigged that it was an AR wall. And I was like, oh, this looks really good. How did they do this? And then um, subsequently, I watched Ready Room with Will Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton. Will Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton. Uh, and they did a little video package of you know explaining the uh, AR wall. And I think Jason Zimmerman. Jason Zimmerman is the video effects guy or videographer or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Emmy nominated or Emmy winning, who knows. Um, and he had come up with this idea that apparently Discovery now shares with Strange New Worlds. So we can expect to see this wonderful effect on Strange New Worlds next year. Why? Oh, well, I wanted to say wonderful and bonkers at the same time. And bonkers. Just said wonkers. Wonkers. That's wonkers. Yes, there was a lot of lovely things in this episode. It, I kept, I, I just... I was so delightfully um, entertained by the seeing them, my friends again. Mm. <laughs> my friends. My friends. That's so uh, cute. Dr. Colbert and Adira. And even there was a, a bit of Gray, which was great. Oh, uh, I didn't know because I know Gray is, is incorporeal at this point. Um, but uh, you really got to see everyone. You got to see them really in their element. Um, one thing I did note was that there's this weird uncertainty going on with Tilly. Like, is it a lack of self-confidence? Yeah. Or does she just not know if she wants to remain in the 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 the, the, the Starfleet anymore? Or what the deal is? She got this promotion to lieutenant. And maybe she thinks it was too soon. But Michael has this utmost confidence in Tilly. Mm-hmm. You know? And she did uh, well made, on the away mission. She did fantastic. She just had that one moment where she, they were like, what are you going to do next? And she was like, I don't know which was a little scary, but it seeing that interaction reminded me of just the first time Michael and Tilly are together in, in Tilly's room. room. Yeah. Yeah. And Tilly's like, you know, <laughs> something about snoring and that's my bed or something. Her mother tongue. Yeah. yeah. It's just Tilly was so wonderful. And now she's like a little bit more steady. She's sort of like the, she has like a mixture between, I would describe her as like, if you're doing a TNG uh, comparison mm-hmm. she's like a mixture of in in relationship to uh, Michael she's like a mixture of uh, of Anna Troy and Beverly Crusher do you know what I mean her relationship she's like Michael's sounding board the person that Michael can go and talk to uh, and, and the, in the capacity that Jean-Luc could only ever like talk to his about his fears and worries with Deanna Troy, and then he can only really confide personally in. Uh, hmm. In uh, I see what you're saying there, Doctor Crusher. Yeah. Anyway, I just like that she's got this. She's like so grounded for Michael, who seems grounded, but even as the president points out, does have the. I think her one. This is my other note: the Achilles heel of Michael. She's compelled to save everyone. Mm-hmm. She doesn't want to lose anybody, uh, and that has been. That's like a. That is is can be great, but can also be her weakness. And I wrote, uh, Michael's Achilles heel, this ain't your Kirk's Federation. Because 200 years prior to this in the Federation, 
that's all Kirk does. He's like, well, dude, no, I got to leave that. He jumps that thing. The Klingons kill his son. He, he's fighting fist punch, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. But now this this president's like, we need you to be a little cool. We need you to stay on the ship, essentially. <laughs> yeah, Michael went off to do her spacewalk. And the president was like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do that? Really? Which is interesting because I didn't know whose side to be on in that instance. Mm-hmm. It was like, if you're really going to save these people... You do want the person with the most time in one of those machines, which Michael was. Yeah. Uh, I think it betrays that she has a huge amount of confidence in her crew that they can handle the ship while she's off doing something particular. But at the same time, it is, you know, the captain leaving the ship to do something incredibly dangerous. And she nearly didn't make it back. She nearly didn't make Mm. it. I agree with the president's assessment of Michael, but I don't know that it's incorrect. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. That is fair. Um, I just felt with Tilly like there was, you know, we were meant to see a maturity. We were meant to see like a little graduation, not only with her rank, but with her as a person. And I think where she and Michael have been besties, I think she's looked up to Michael and she's relied on Michael. But I think now it's becoming a little more even. Right. Which it always surreptitiously has been. Yeah. Because I, I really feel like Michael because she was raised by Vulcans <laughs> is very good at seeming as if she's very much in control and not phased by situations. But, you know, I mean, she's been through what Michael has been through in relative a year and a half's time <laughs> from like, well, maybe it's a little bit longer. She was in jail for a while, but from like losing Giorgio and the original Shenju and going to jail and then coming back and then meeting what's his tush and him being super evil and going to the mirror universe and seeing Giorgio again. At the same time, she was dating that guy who turned out to be like a clandestine Klingon warrior. They were in love, but then he tried to, he killed Culber and tried to ruin them. I mean, she went through all that. Then she met her mother. Then she had to travel uh, almost a, a thousand years into the future and was by herself for a year. I mean, that stretch, I, I, it, the trauma she has gone through personally, let alone as a Starfleet officer, is absurd. So I think that speaks that well fair. to how much yep. of a rock Tilly and Saru have been for mm-hmm. her as she's had to deal with all those things. And Georgia, who's now gone. Yeah. One thing I would like to chat about is we didn't really mention Saru. Yes. Oh, sorry. Did I skip my Saru chapter? I did. Maybe you maybe mentioned did you? No, I'm not I sure. Think I missed but it. we d- we may have glazed over yeah. it like a like a donut. Um I don't know. No, it was good. I was gonna I say like, like a crispy cream. <laughs> but we did sort of glaze over it. Um but it was I I mean one, the AR wall of that room. Oh yeah. I mean they're making really good use out of it. Yeah, they're using the heck out of it. They really I mean they have to right. bloody budget on it. it's huge. Um but it looked fantastic, and you can see. What were the other creatures? I forgot the name of the, the black creatures. I meant to look it up, but I, I was like, I just noted that they both were, their council is both yeah. creatures together, and their room is underwater. Yeah, so that they can be together and, you know, I don't know if say rule together, but they can, you know, make decisions and whatever together. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, like, they are black and weird looking like you just don't want to trust them but i thought they did a good job of making them less ominous now they're like really? floating in their windows and they look scary i mean sharks are scary but sharks are nice i mean they're not nice but you know what i'm saying like things that we are terrified of that look scary to us are not necessarily bad i mean i i think right. they were meant to be scary probably here. All right. Let me get super nerdy. <clears throat> uh, they're just as the, the Kelpians are uh, biologically predetermined to sense the coming of death and to be prey. Uh, I think these, the the other creatures, are you looking it up? Are you Googling it? No, I'm not Googling oh, okay. it. I was going to say, we have, we have to Google it? I mean, I could, yeah, I mean, if we got a cue for it. You can Google that. The Baul. Woo! Yes, the Baul. Wow, you're very you, you cute. The thing and looked it up as well. Right. <laughs> uh, That's his finger first. Yeah, Baul. They do seem. They still seem creepy, and they have little clouds of darkness floating around their heads. But they. I. My only question is like, what do they eat? Since they're not eating kelpians anymore, just like rabbits and goats and stuff. Well, I mean, they'd have to go on land to get them, so I suspect not. Fish. But then how did they get the kelp? I don't know. 
But the Kelpians had to su- su- surrender themselves to the Baul. That was the whole thing. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, well, that was a yes. nice little side. I thought that was nice, and and since I didn't mention it, I'll say I thought it was nice that Sukal uh, mm. went to to Saru and said, "Listen, I have other friends now, and people always look at me and think of the burn and be worried, but there are less of them now than there were before." And just as Saru gave that speech about what is your home, the planet, or the stars, or the galaxy, are we together? Whatever, you know, Sukal is like, you know, you can be here. Your heart can be here at home in Kaminar, and you can go and join your friends because it seems like uh, there's a little wanderlust in Saru's eyes as he looks at the skies above Kaminar. Mm. So do you, I mean, does Michael have an official number one yet? Ooh. Because I wonder if Saru's going to come back and be number one. Book does say before he leaves, you know, this whole thing that Michael's doing this, he says, I'm sorry that Saru couldn't be here to see it. And Michael's obviously mm. still pretty, pretty sad Bummed. about it. I and wonder, I, mm. is it Reese? Yes. Reese takes the con twice in this episode. That's true. I wonder though, Sukal releasing Saru and allowing him to go back to the ship. That's so that's my thing. And I think also part of that is like the actor who plays Sukal is fantastically um, popular. And I don't think he will sign on to do the series. I think he'll probably come back to do bits and pieces. Um, So I think that's one of the reasons that they're kind of surrendering Sukal off. And then Book, because his his home planet's just disappeared. I think Book is going to go off in search of the Glee, his people Quijani, and just uh, to, called. yeah, the Quajon. Quajon. I don't know. Maybe it's just plural. Um, to potentially call it like start a colony. That's my theory. Well, I tin time. time. I love that theory. Um, mm-hmm. I think that. Well, here's the thing. I am a big, big, big dumb nerd and i really one of the coolest things i've ever seen is this con as the concept of of uh of gravitational lensing which is like uh what they talk about that happened before the ship disappeared and stuff uh that there was like this lensing of the stars and basically that is what happens when the gravity is so immense usually around like a black hole or something like that or like a, a big giant star uh, the gravity is so intense that it causes the light to bend as if it was being refla- refracted through a lens, through a glass. And so you get this weird lens ish- effect, making things seem closer or further away than they are. So my big hope in my bullet point number three was uh, that this new threat traveled to Quajan. Maybe they're all right. Maybe they got transported somewhere else and we saw a destroyed planet that's not Quajan. That's true. Someone else could have come to the rescue. Uh, well, we just, it's a mystery. I mean, we assume they're dead because that's the scary thing. But I'm hoping that, yes, there are some Quajans still alive, especially little nephew boy whose name I forgot to write down. He's very cute. Um, no, not. <laughs> Oops. The only other thing I wanted to mention was the Culber Stamets moment where they were so worried about Adira. Yeah, they were there because that's. When everyone their came kid. back, they were. Yeah. 100%. I know, but it was just really yeah. cute that it was like, this is our kid. Oh, yeah. Like, has it was just that, like, this is our kid. And oh, no. yeah. When St- when Stamets goes, you know. is Adir all right? Uh, and everyone else, are they okay? Was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. I love, there was a moment Stamets had when Michael was like, Stamets, we, you know, you need to sort this out. And he was like, I have, this would take three hours. And he just had this, like, it, it, almost, it was very scotty yes. to me. It was almost comedic. Yeah, yeah. Michael says, how soon can we get more power? And he's like, uh, four hours at least. And Michael's like, we don't have that kind of time. He's like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. He, what do you, know, you what want me to do? And then do? He's, uh, he nothing. basically says, I'm giving her all she got, Captain, when he's like, you, you got 20% of power left in the EPS grid, and she's, and that's all we got. It was a total Montgomery Scott moment. Yeah. That was really great. Absolutely. I enjoyed that. Um, and then my final thing was just that I love that this episode was called the Kobayashi Maru, because as we know, that is the test mm. that they give people who are who are signing up to go into the command path when they reach, I guess, the like, mm-hmm. commander or captaincy level. Uh, it's a test that you cannot pass. You cannot save everyone. You can't save the crew of your ship or the crew that you're trying to save, because like Klingon word, warbirds of prey show up and stuff and one is cloaked. And it's supposed to teach you how to accept defeat. Now, in the history of Star Trek, usually they bring it up to be like, yeah, mm-hmm. just, there's no win situations and you have to get used to it. But every time Kirk has faced something that has been 
applied to be akin to the Kobayashi Maru effect, he has won the day by doggedly sticking it out. And I'm trying to think. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what I was wondering with the whole thing with the president and Michael was do is it like a parents just don't understand kind of thing like the president the reason you're not a captain is because you think in this cold logic of there are acceptable losses sometimes you can't win you don't try every available thing and you're willing to risk your crew to save people that are important to the crew or uh are they right and is a captain supposed to be more abject and out of remove but every captain that we've loved from Kirk mm. to Picard to to Cisco to Janeway to Archa uh, has mm -hmm. risked everything to save a vital member of the crew, no matter whether they were an ensign or like a cadet or something like that. Uh, and that's part of, I think, the DNA of being a captain. But we shall see. Indeed, we shall. Um, shall we move on to quotable moments? Let's do... Quotable moments. You know, our drops are starting to trend to much, much more British, <laughs> just in general. Obviously, I don't know who did our <laughs> quick chat thing, but they were obviously British. And quotable mm. moments is <clears throat> very <Indeed>. gosh. <clears throat> uh, quotable moments. I've started, did I say I've started watching Downton? Careful, oh, I might no, start Oh, no, you started Downton watching podcast. Downton? Oh, I oh, love it. What's a weekend? Um... Oh, yes, indeed. Is there What's a Downton? I mean, listen, we're talking about Star Trek, but obviously we have other interests. Is there a Downton movie coming out soon? Is that true? Yes. And actually, I met somebody who has a Downton podcast called Downton Blabby. Oh. Shout out to Sandy Max. Love it. Yep. No, fantastic. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Blabby. But um, <laughs> turned out it's a great title. Anyway, and uh, I, my wife and I have been watching this, <clears throat> and she gets quite a kick out of it because I love doing the, the Countess's uh, accent. And uh, what's it? Lord Grantham came down wearing a, a tuxedo, the new fashion of tuxedo. And the Countess looks at him and says, Whatever next? Pajamas? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife, like, thankfully, because uh, if I did this any, like in, in the UK with anyone else, they would just roll their eyes at me. Yeah. But my wife finds it quite amazing. I assume your wife has not seen Downton Abbey before. This is new for both of you. This is new for both of us, yes. Oh, excellent. I'm mm. jealous. It's great fun. I thoroughly enjoyed I, this. I may need to do a rewatch because I don't think I watched the ah. last season in this new movie. Is anyway. Yeah, <laughs> we digress. This is a set phasers podcast about Star Trek. This is supposed <laughs> to go. Do we need a section of the show that is just a digression? <laughs> Here's a digression based on something we sort of talked about. Now, quotable moments. Uh, well, I have a couple. There's not like a ton in this episode that I really moved me, but. Uh, the ones I really loved were in the first, the pre-credits sequence. Yeah. There was a lot of great one-liners in that. Um, uh, I, the, the back and forth where the misunderstand, uh, you know, they talk about grudge and she's a pet and I love her and I feed her treats. And then the Al Shane ask, is she grateful? And Book says, no, no, not in any way. And uh, the Al Shane, do you expect us to be? Have you come to make us pets? I thought it was It was great. almost a Lower Decks opening. Very Lower decks yeah. yes. Yeah, it was shenanigans. Mm -hmm. It was total shenanigans. But, you know, it ended... <laughs> it was total shenanigans. And it ended nothing like Lower Decks. Course, yeah, you will take us to your ship, we will free the queen, is like something that would yes, come right that's out very of true. Decks. It's a Mike McMahon <laughs> moment, indeed. Mm -hmm. Mike McMahon. Do you have another one? Uh, I have one more for sure. I love when Book is about to leave and he tells Michael, she's like upset that the president's going to be a politician. He says, she's doing what politicians do. Don't punch them in the head. Yeah. I, like that. I had a couple. I think there was Saru had quite a, a nice little speech. He had some real wisdom oh, moments yeah. there. I think he mm -hmm. talked about Wisdomous. celebrating our interconnectedness. Um, and I just thought, oh, Saru is going to be the one with the wisdom and the quotes and the speeches. The new president of the Federation. Mm -hmm, very possibly. The other one I loved, um, and I can see this popping up elsewhere, was Squiddled. Squiddled was great. Why did I not write Squiddled. that down? I don't know. Destroyed beyond repair. Yeah, is, is, is its yes. definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it. Squiddles. I'm like, oh, we're going to. We're, I think we're going to use squiddled. I think we are going to use squiddled. Squiddled. <laughs> and uh, the only other one was oh, oh, should be good to go, which seemed to amuse everybody on yes the bridge. And I was like, uh, okay, that sounds a bit funny. But anyway, oh, oh, should be good. To you go. know, these guys—they're they nerds. Ones. They like they do poems yeah. for fun. 
at lunch, you know? They're just That's super true. nerds. Well, there we are. That is all I had for quotable moments. Anything else? Uh, I just love when Michael is running with Book and uh, in the first scene and they're first running away and they're like, and there's a cliff. And Michael says, why is there always yes. a cliff? Uh, was another great, very lower Dexy style moment, but it fit very well it in the did. Um That's all I've got. So I guess it's <gasps> time for next time. Next time. Next time on Set Phasers. Yes, next time on Set Phasers, we will be discussing season four, episode two of Star Trek Discovery, which according to Wikipedia will be called, quote, Anomaly. Like, there's quotations in the title. Oh, I just knocked my microphone over. I'm a little too excited. Uh, it will be called Quote Anomaly. We'll be discussing that uh, next Monday. So thank you very much for joining us, those of you who are in our Patreon and watching live. And thank you for those of you who are listening to us as a downloaded podcast. If you enjoyed the program, you can go back and catch old episodes uh, uh, and find our new podcast wherever you get podcasts from. Uh, every Monday, please subscribe if you can. Yeah, and go and check out our Patreon. We are patreon.com forward slash set phasers to join our watch parties, get exclusive early access to our video and audio episodes, and more. We've got official Star, Star Trek merchandise. We've got official set phasers merch, some of which Aki is currently wearing and dancing in just now. Uh, which you can only see if you are a patron. Oops. It says highly illogical. Yes, my wife makes our merch. Hmm. Bless her cotton socks. She's the best. Um, so anyway. What's next? Pajamas? P- pajamas? Uh, we don't do pajamas yet. We could if there's a if there's a, a desire for pajamas. Listen, hey man, I'm, always, I'm about that pajama life. Give the people what they want. That's what I say. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Uh, oh, did you mention the... The set phase, the podcast. Did you mention the podcast? <laughs> Did I mention the podcast? Uh, mention and if you want to support us in our continuing mission to discover what else Star Trek has in store for us, uh, in this case, Discovery, uh, we uh, you can patronize us. We'd be delighted uh, by going to patreoncom set phasers. As we said at the top of the show, there's various levels you can join at, and very cool things you can do. And we would very much appreciate you joining us on this join voyage into the unknown. Join our crew. Permission to come aboard. Permission granted. And goes out. Pep. Pep. Well, until next time, I'm Stevie Mans. And I'm Aki Burmese, and this has been Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Computer. End program. Mm-hmm.